Okay, everybody, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, first and foremost, welcome to everybody this evening for our NMOA mentoring webinar. This is uh, basically the result of some of the other webinars we've had over the past, uh, gosh, since the end of April, however long that's been. The way this will work for those of you who haven't joined us is there's a number of faces on here that I've seen quite a bit and welcome back for those of you who are joining us for a first NMOA webinar. We always start the webinars with everybody muted. Um, that being said, if during this you want to say something, just unmute yourself and interject. The other option is there is a chat box and you can chat in that area and Nate will be monitoring that or if Nate's speaking, I'll monitor it. This is very informal. We're just kind of starting off with uh, talking about some mentoring because that was a subject that came to us from some officials who just felt like it's a, a growth area for us as an association, which I, I definitely agree. So we're just gonna get started. And like I said, if there's something you wanna say as we roll on, please feel free to jump in and just unmute yourself. Um, but you are muted right now. And then you can also type into the uh, into the chat area. So um, if you are on here and your full name isn't showing on the participant list, if you can please go in to the participant list, click on more and click on rename and type your full name so that we know who you are. So there's people who I just have a first name. Um, we're gonna take a picture of who's on here so that way we can keep a list of who wants to be a mentor or who needs to be mentored. So I don't I don't know who mom and dad is. I know who my mom and dad are, but I know that they're not on this call. Uh, Richard will need your last name. JRM, I think I know who that is, but if you could put your name, Joey, um, and then 504-4188, if you guys can all put your names in, I would appreciate it. So we'll get started. This is kind of divided into two parts. There's one for mentors, one for people who need to be mentored, and all of the information is uh, interrelated. So we'll just get started. Okay, so for the mentors. What is a mentor? Mentor, as defined in Merriam-Webster Dic Dictionary, is a trusted counselor or guide, or a tutor or coach. And then what does it take to be a mentor? So the short answer, which we learned from a football official who was actually on one of our webinars this year is a mentor has to be willing to train an official or a group of officials to one day take his job. So that's from NFL referee, Scott Novak. He actually did the webinar with us pretty early in the season. And when he said that, it just it kind of, it struck me because a lot of people over the years have come to me and said, you know, I'd really love to be a mentor. But then when you put it in those terms, you have to be willing to train an official or group of officials to one day take your job. A lot of people would bow out because not everybody is, has that selflessness that's required to be a mentor. So that's one of the things that you want to look at as you think about being a mentor or those of you who are being mentored, you want to look for that in a potential person who, who's going to take you under your under their wing. So what does it take? Not everybody can or should be a mentor. Just because someone's been around for 30 years doesn't mean that he or she has the ability to mentor. So a lot of times when you start thinking about mentorship, one of the things that you think is, well, you know, this person's the most veteran member of our association. Maybe I should go to him or her for advice and to Really, you know, so hold on a second. Eat it, eat it, I just, Dan, can you? Okay, I just sorry. muted her. <laughs> so, as, as you come on, we'll try to mute because there's a lot of background noise. So, what we've discovered is a lot of times the most veteran group member is not necessarily the best mentor. There are times where some veteran officials, and this is not a general statement, I'm just saying some where they are happy with the games that they have, and there is a little bit of a thought in the back of their head of, well, if I mentor this person, they might take my games. So the, the most veteran person isn't always going to be the ideal mentor. And that's, that's not always, but sometimes. Um, in order to be a mentor, you have to possess more than just experience and knowledge. You have to have the desire to teach. You have to have the desire to be an 
a support system for your mentee. You have to have a lot more than just knowing the rule book and knowing the mechanics book. There's a degree of, of counseling that takes place in this. There's a degree of, you know, committing yourself to watching your mentee's games. Um, so there's definitely a time element and a time commitment that's involved as well. And that's something that you have to consider as you as you potentially sign up to be a mentor. Yeah. So, oh, go ahead. So no, so no, something to think about with that. And and I think that we have a lot of veteran officials that that feel like, oh, hey, this uh, second year official, third year officials come in and you know they're they're not capable of of mentoring because what experience or what knowledge do they have of the game? Well, it's important to know that being a mentor doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to teach, you know, their mentee the rules of the game, but maybe just even the process of getting started. You know, sometimes a 30 year veteran doesn't remember what it was like to get started where a second, third year official knows exactly, you know, Hey, this is what it's going to cost. It's going to be a little expensive to start. Don't get discouraged. Those are the things that are important. So being a mentor doesn't necessarily mean that you know the rules and you're proficient in what sport you're officiating. It, it has a lot to do with how you kind of bring somebody along with you. So keep that in mind. That's a great point, Nate, because I think a lot of times what we've kind of discovered, and Nate and I have talked quite a bit about this over the last several years, is as new officials are coming into the association, they sometimes get a little bit lost in the shuffle. And a lot of times they'll register, we give them the information for local associations, and then they, they don't make that connection with the local group, either because they don't make the phone call or because the local group doesn't get a hold of those people. There's a disconnect sometimes, and that's why, you know, like Nate said, a lot of times we take all of this for granted if we've been in it a long time as far as, well, this is where you go to register and I just know that you kind of have to put yourself back in that first year official shoes about where you go to register, where are the NMOA documents, where you get your uniforms, all of those things. So it becomes second nature to a 25 year official. It's still pretty fresh in the minds of somebody who's been around two or three years. So that mentorship aspect does take a lot of different looks. Um, the selfless portion, you have to be selfless and you have to be willing to make your mentee better than you are. And that's something that kind of flowing into the next one, that takes a great degree of confidence and it takes a servant's heart. So you do have to be willing to understand that, you know, there's some people who just have it. They're born with it. And while, while we might have to work hard to get there, they might be more naturally athletic than us. They might be taller than us. They might be faster than us. There might be things physically that just, they have it working for them because of genetics. Well, you know, maybe maybe me at five four and not very fast with bad knees. Um, you know, what what am I going to do? You can't fix that. That's that's just how I made up. So you do have to have that willing willingness to make yourself better or make to to make them better than you are. And you have to be confident. You have to not worry about are they going to take my games. And you do have to have that heart of a servant to give back to the association to give back to incoming officials and kind of to, you know, believe in that greater good, which is number five. So you've got to understand that all of us who are on this webinar tonight, we're not going to be around forever. And we have to want to leave the organization better than we found it. We've got to take the organization over our personal needs and interests and selfishness. And we've all got a little bit of that. So being a mentor, you've got to have that uh, that selflessness about you. So as I was saying, you have to leave the association bare that was you started. And that's something that has always been a goal of mine. When I started in 1997, the association looked very different than it does now. And, you know, my hope is as I ride off into the sunset, that I've left it better than I found it. And if I haven't, then that means I've failed miserably. If I have, then it means that I'm, you know, I can go to, go to sleep with a clear conscience and, and be okay with what I've contributed. And that's what each individual official really needs to, to focus on. And then getting over the fear that someone will, will take your games. My goodness, there are plenty of games to go around. And if your mentee gets 
a couple of games that you thought you should have had, that's a feather in your hat. And I think that mentors need to approach it as such. And that goes right into the next one. The desire for a mentee to succeed at a higher level than you did. It's like your parents. As, you know, as parents, you want your kids to do and be and accomplish more and be better than you were. And as a mentor, you have to take that same approach. And if you have a mentee who, you know, gets into you know, gets into a varsity schedule and then makes the state championships and, you know, starts calling some division two uh, basketball or volleyball or whichever sport, that, that's a tribute to you. And I think sometimes we lose focus about how important that is because, you know, just like raising a kid, there's that whole, it takes a village. I think that it's true with bringing in new officials. It's going to take a lot of people helping out and being supportive and being proud when they succeed and and you know you've got to get rid of that jealousy that sometimes takes place and and really understand that um you know there's there's something bigger than just you and and that sense of pride not being envious um and really kind of celebrating your your mentee and letting them know that you're proud of them and being that support instead of just wait a minute, now he or she is surpassing me. And now I don't you know, now I don't want to be around him anymore, because I'm jealous. So you there's so much that goes into it outside of the, the X's and O's of the various sports, there's just this servant role and this leadership role that we need for mentors to have. Uh, Nate, do you have anything on any of that? Yeah, actually, slide back to the last slide real quick, if you can, because I'm gonna, um, and, and we talk about not everyone can or should be a mentor. Um, now you can, sorry, totally thought I saw something different. So go on, if you can go back. Um, look, if, if you are just an, sorry, yeah. Okay. If you're just an <laughs> official and, and you just want to officiate, then, then fine. If, but if you plan on mentoring, plan on having a positive attitude, having an, a positive outlook, um, because trust me, I mean, Dan and I will, will tell you that there's a lot of negative outlooks towards officiating from officials. You know, they're either unhappy with schedules, they're unhappy with their signers, they're, you know, at that point, if that's you and you can tell yourself, you know, I, I'm unhappy in the association, then you probably don't need to mentor. And you need to be honest with yourself because, look, we need positive people because these new officials that come in, you know, um, they will feed off of everything that is given to them. So if you have a negative ad, ad, uh, if you have a negative outlook, then you know we you probably don't want a mentor and I think you need to be honest with yourself at that point. And and that is definitely a great point. It goes along with, you know, we talk a lot in officiating obviously about recruitment and retention of officials. So our recruitment efforts have been good. We're looking at states around us who are losing anywhere between 15 and 25 percent of their officials each year. In New Mexico, we actually grew over the past couple of years. So now mentorship becomes a bigger issue because it's so tied in with retention. We've got to make sure that as new officials come in, we're taking care of them. We're fostering them into the process. We're helping them understand how the big picture takes place. And within that picture are a million little subsets that we have to make sure we're addressing so that the official feels like they've got some support from local association, from state association. They can't just feel like they're being thrown out into games without people talking to them about, you know, communication and game management and some of the things that aren't necessarily in the rule book. So our, you know, as an association, as a state association with you at the local level, we're all charged with keeping them in. Now that we got them, we got to keep them because our population, just like everyone else, is getting more and more veteran. And as people retire, we have to make sure we have people coming in to fill their shoes. And it's incumbent upon everybody who's a current official to be an active part of that process. So the three C's of mentorship as we know them, um, consultant, counselor, and cheerleader. So consultant, this is informing your mentees about policies and practices of the association. 
And this is something Nate and I have really been trying to do association wide is in, you know, informing our officials of where to find things because a lot of times we'll have a 20 year official who doesn't know we have a constitution. Um, showing them where to find that stuff online, familiarizing yourself with them. You can always send them to us, but a lot of times once people establish a relationship with you, they'll, they just feel more comfortable having that personal face-to-face, -face, hey, can I ask you a question? And that those are things that you need to be prepared to answer. Helping with the registration process, uniforms, NMOA documents. One of the things that one of our previous uh, presenters sent a webinar earlier was even if you have uniforms or equipment that you can donate to your mentee, if you're obviously, if you're close to the same size, um, you know, help them so it defrays some of their startup costs. If you're getting ready to buy new uniforms, talk to your mentee and, and find out. And even if it's not your mentee, if there's new officials coming to, into your group, that's a great way to help a, you know, an 18 year old college student get his or her foot in the door of officiating. Um, advise as to camps or clinics. And this is something that we try to do quite a bit when we get calls about officials who want to go to a camp and we feel like it might be something as a first year official, it might be way over their head. We're going to be honest with them because we don't want people to go to a camp or a clinic and have a really bad experience because, you know, just the, the level is above where they are. So make sure that you're educated and that if you don't know, make sure you're asking questions. They're gonna look to you for answers, but if you don't know all the answers, then, then that's okay. Just make sure you, you can point them in the right direction to find that. Um, provide the what, why, and how of thinking beyond simple advice. So that's, if you're gonna tell someone information or give them advice, you have to tell them all of the stuff behind it. It's more than just, this is how it is because I said so. You've got to tell them why it's a certain mechanic or why we have a policy about everybody has to wear the same uniform. It can be very basic or it can be very elaborate, but you can't just give people um, little bits and pieces and hope that they understand what they're getting into. And then watch your mentee at his or her games and provide input. So, you know, we can mentor and help with all of this stuff. But if we're not actually watching the official work, it makes it very, very difficult to maintain that mentor-mentee relationship. You need to be able to give them some insight as to what maybe they can do to improve. And I know in some sports we have evaluation and observation systems and others we don't. So those newer officials are really going to rely upon veteran officials to give them some feedback. So Dana, there was a comment. There was a comment in here that I, I really liked, and and Richard Sanchez um, actually talks about um, you know working with your assigner to to uh, you know assigners trust their veteran officials. That's that is fact. So if as a veteran official and my assigner trusts me, if I had that conversation saying you know what, hey, uh, Big John Vic, you know I'm he's my mentee. I I want to work with him. Um, I guarantee you that assigner is going to work with you on those types of assignments. So that was a, that was a great point. So as a mentor, work with your assigner um, so that um, these individuals can work with you. So um, also, I, talking about the documents, I, I wanted to uh, point out a I won't a specific group. But there's a football group in our state that is um, when I every year when I go through the ratings. Okay. Um, State eligible, state eligible, state eligible, state eligible, state eligible, registered. Well, they've only been in two years. Playoff eligible. Well, they've only been in three years. Okay. State eligible, state eligible, state eligible. Well, there's something to be said, and that is they have a very good uh, mentor program, but they do a very good job of educating their incoming officials on how to get to state eligible. Um, per, I guess, Per the the percentage of state eligible officials in that group are are better than any other group in the state in any sport. So there's something to be said about their training when officials come in, but their mentor program, and it all comes back to mentoring. Those are excellent points, uh, Richard and Nate. I appreciate that. And I do see a comment. Uh, last year was my first year in three sports. I didn't see an evaluation once, and game films are hard to get to get look a look at and get better. Um, 
you know, one of the things we've tried to switch our focus on with regard to evaluations is making sure that newer officials are getting eyes on them. We've had a lot of focus on veteran officials to see who we can use for state events. And now we know that our, our focus needs to be. So um, Jerry, that's part of the reason why. And game film, it's something we're working on with coaches right now to try and get more game film because the availability has been a kind of a roadblock. So it, it's definitely a work in progress and I appreciate you letting us know um, you know, you can always email Nate and I if you if you really are wanting an evaluation and you haven't been seen yet, you can always email Nate and I and we'll try to work to get somebody to come out and see you. And that's for everybody, not just not just the person that asks the question. You know, we are short on evaluators, but we'll do our best to make sure we can either get a veteran to come look at you or someone else that's available so that you get some feedback. Okay, next role, counselor. And this, you know, Nate and I talk a lot about this. I would say about 80% of every day at work for me is the role of counselor. And as a mentee, that's gonna be the same for you. Um, your role as a counselor is listening and understanding the concerns and frustrations of mentees. That doesn't always mean you have to respond. Sometimes they just need a sounding board. And we find that all the time in our office. Um, make sure if you're having a conversation with them and they're really looking for advice that, you know, you don't just say, you're right, everybody, you know, everybody is terrible and I don't even know why I officiate anymore because now you're not even being helpful or productive at that point. Um, you know, if you're frustrated, then please have a talk with us or whomever it is that's frustrating you. But make sure you try to maintain a positive attitude with your mentee and really help them through that. Um, you need to be prepared for either circumstance, whether you're just going to be a willing ear and a sounding board, or if the mentee is saying, hey, I had a partner who called in my area all night, and how do I handle that as a new official? Be prepared to give advice as well if they're asking you direct questions, but also understand that sometimes they might just need to vent, and, and that's okay too. So you just got to be prepared for, for whatever they may kind of throw in your direction. And then the last one, which is kind of my favorite, is that of cheerleader. So being an enthusiastic supporter, be the first person that congratulates mentees on a job well done, celebrate successes, and lift the mentee up during the, head time, the hard times. So as a mentor, it's so important that, you know, when, you're, when your mentee goes from junior high and now they're calling some varsity and then varsity, those are all little victories in this little adventure of officiating. So make sure that you're there to be like, hey, great job. Um, providing pr constructive criticism, build them up and don't tear them down. So even if you go watch them in a game and, and maybe they struggled a little bit, you don't have to, you don't have to rip them. Just have a conversation about things that maybe you, they can do to improve. Um, and be prepared if they do have a game there where maybe they went into the tank a little bit that you're able to provide them some support and lift them up and let them know that you know hey we've all been there we've all we've all gone in the tank we've all had a bad game and make sure they know that it's not just them because i think that that's you know that's so hard because officials are their own worst critics so as veteran officials as mentors that's something that is so so imperative is that you let them know that hey, it's part of it, and, and it won't be the last time you mess up, and I know it doesn't feel very good, but you learn from your mistakes, you know, all that stuff. You have to coach them up a little bit. Uh, Nate, anything on either of those two? No, so there was a question in there about, um, do you recommend uh, family members or spouses mentoring, mentee type situation? Absolutely, anytime that you feel comfortable, but there will be a point, um, Rosita, that um, that, mentee will need to move on to somebody you know for different advice um, but to start out absolutely we you know family members are the best type of mentors and so um, as far as cheerleading and even going back to the last slide um, just being there um, you know I, I I can I can tell you that you know as as Dana being one of my mentors I mean I don't know how often I go into her office and I just sometimes I just go and and she just listens and then 
we flip to slide two or slide three cheerleader and and then she supports me and she's but she's also able to give me that uh, constructive criticism that's actually going to help me grow and so um you know it's 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 a valuable thing to be able to listen but also give honest feedback and that you know that's a great point because i think one of the best things about being a mentor is you can use every mistake that you've ever made to help to mentor your mentee so that hopefully they don't make that mistake again because a lot of you know when Nate and I talk a lot of it is based on you know screw ups I've made where I'm like okay here's how to avoid this um, and that's something that is really positive it almost makes whatever mess up that we've had kind of worth it because then you can impart that wisdom on someone else um, hey, Wilson Holland, I see that you've put a message in here. Can you unmute yourself and talk about that? Wilson, are you there? Oh, you know what? Uh, did he put that in private? Because he did. He's unmuted, but I'm not hearing him. So what Wilson uh, said is have your mentee watch. Is this the same message? No. So, um, oh, he says Mike's not working. So he just said mentor with the right intent. We can't control how we feel about each other. We can control how we behave with others. So I think that that's something that's brilliant. And he gave that, he gave credit to Scott Twardowski, who is an NBA referee. Um, that is very important there might be somebody that maybe as a as a person you know you may not they may not be your best friend but you and you can't control that but you can control how you behave with somebody else and the advice that you give and and your value as a mentor to that person um rick carbohol will comment in here it's extremely important to point out all of the things they did right as well as the wrong things this provides encouragement as well as reinforces the good things and that's absolutely correct we always say if you give them you know one negative thing give them like three positive because it can't all be negative and if you've got to reach for something hey your shoes were really shine nicely that's okay just make it something that's positive because you don't want it to be you did this wrong you did this wrong you did this wrong because who who wants to go back to that? Um, and then Steve, Steve Wagner's got a good, good uh, message or uh, motto: "You learn from your mistakes, so stick with me, and you're going to learn a lot." <laughs> that's that's good, Steve. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, Lily, thoughts on getting a different mentor from year to year, getting different perspectives, mechanics, options, and more context. Absolutely, and. You can have more than one mentor in a year. I know a lot of officials who will, you know, they have a guy or a gal that they rely on for rules, and then they have somebody else that they rely on for, how do I talk to coaches? That is that is okay. You don't have to marry yourself to one mentor and go, okay, Nate's my mentor, and he's the only person I'm going to listen to, because then you're going to be a Nate clone, and and we don't want just a bunch of clones. We want people who have diverse ways to you know think and act if if we're all i mean we want to be uniform but we don't want to be just drones and and lily to that point as well is there's a point where you know and and there are a couple people that i mentor now that i know that they're real close to leaving me behind and needing more um knowledge and that i can't provide so that's okay and 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 mentees should always continue to look for those mentors that are going to help them get to that level that they want. If it's the the eighth grade championship championship game or the 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 state championship game, whatever the case may be, um, you know they're going to need that mentor that will help them for whatever um, level they're trying to reach. And then uh, let's see, Mark Salazar, we need to remember that even if we didn't have a formal mentoring program or associations, we still have those veterans who were our mentors on those many trips or even local games. We owe it to the new officials to help them be the best they can, they can possibly be. And that's exactly correct. You know, a formal mentoring system is, is a goal, but it's not everything. Those veteran officials over the years, they're super helpful. I mean, a lot of times it's the varsity officials are sitting, waiting for the 
their game to start when the JV game's going on and you know being a part of the the post game with that crew and providing input and advice it does it's going to take a lot of different forms there's no one way to make the mentoring system right um it's just the willingness to help others get better um that that's really the goal of a mentoring program and then uh wilson said he would zoom with anyone on the basketball side who would like to break down film with him and if you need wilson's Contact information, let me know and I'll get that. Uh, Paul Goris, officiating as a team sport, it most certainly is. Uh, it would be really difficult to do any of this on our own. Um, the more you teach, the more you share. Oh my gosh, yes. And then, uh, oh, Jerry, we're gonna get there. So Jerry said, us younger officials have to be willing to take it and get better. You're leading us into our next chapter, so that's a good segue. Um, anything else before we roll on? This is great conversation on the chat. I appreciate everybody's input and engagement in this. So Jerry set this up, which was perfect. Thank you for that. So for the mentees, um, what should you look for in a mentor? So if your local group doesn't have a built-in program, you should look for someone you connect with, someone with similar backgrounds or interests, and someone you can trust. Um, it's okay to terminate a mentoring relationship if you find your mentor is not helping you. And we've had that happen plenty of times where somebody will be like, yeah, I'll mentor you. And then they don't answer the mentee's calls and they've never watched them work a game. And you know, if they were in the same room together, they may not even know it's their mentee. Those are issues. So if as a mentee, you feel like your mentor isn't really invested in, in you as a new official, it's okay to walk away from that. It's just like a bad relationship. If you know if you aren't having a, a good time in that relationship and it's a, it's a mess, then it's okay to break up. Um, ask your local group or our state office to help you find a mentor if you don't have one or if you don't really you know if you're brand brand new and you're not sure who might align with you as far as background or whatever. Um, ask the veteran members in your group, your group leader. Um, your assigner, our office, and we can help connect you with somebody who we know would be a good fit for you. Um, again, the official with the most experience may not be the best mentor. Your mentor might actually be someone younger than you in age, but has experience and wisdom to share with you. And sometimes that's a tough thing if, you know, I'm 44 and my mentor might be 28 and you have to be willing as a, as a, mentor as a mentee to look for somebody that might be younger than you it might not be somebody who's older in age but definitely older in experience you have to have a meaningful connection with that person find someone who will help guide you and won't derail you so when we we're talking about people in the uh in the officiating world who might be a little bit negative or toxic or whatever the case may be that's probably not the person that you want to hook up with because likely they will take you off track a little bit find someone who's positive um, that's so important is just finding somebody who truly loves what they do as an official and and you can see that and you can feel that and you know that with officials within you know two minutes of talking to them if they truly are a positive role model for you so those are just uh some little tips for you so going to touch in on that, Dana, so it is important to, to really surround yourself around positive people. We went back, going back to one of the first things I said, if you're, if you're a negative, if you have an, a negative outlook on officiating and you're just there to make money, you shouldn't mentor. Well, if you're a mentee looking for a mentor, you know who those individuals are. Stay away from them. Um, don't ask them for advice. They're there. Look, we need them. They work. We're happy with them, but they're not mentor material. You know, stick to those people that, that have a positive outlook on officiating. So, you know, from experience, you know, there's always been that group of officials that just, you know, they badmouth the assigner, they mad about, you know, they just, it's a negative outlook. But then you have that group that's, you know, they're talking plays and, and going over rules and, and that's the positive side. So, find that group of individuals to find a mentor and um, stay away from, you know, just like I told the mentors, you know, if you're a negative, if you have a negative outlook, don't be a mentor. 
well, if you're a mentee looking for a mentor, stay away from those individuals and, and you'll know who they are. So how can you be a good mentee? And this goes to what Jerry had typed in the chat. So you have to have the willingness to listen and to learn. You've got to be coachable. So it's just like as former athletes, going back into that mindset of listening and learning and letting somebody teach you. And sometimes as adults, we don't want to be taught. We think, you know, we think we know everything because we're grown-ups. but you've got to be willing to be coached. Don't be, and you've heard this, if you've ever gone to a camp, don't be a yeah butter. Um, if your mentee, veteran official, evaluator, assigner has constructive criticism for you, the last thing they want to hear is, yeah, but I, yeah, but I just, the excuses. You've got to make sure that you have an open mind and that you're receptive to feedback because nothing will turn a mentor off to a mentee faster than somebody who feels like they always have to have it an excuse or a reason or a yeah, but. So um, I think on my on my headstone when I die, it might actually say don't be a yeah, butter on it because that's just something that drives drives mentors and instructors and whatever else crazy. So on the one side, we had said for mentors to make sure they go to their mentees games. If you're a mentee, go to your mentors games, take notes and ask questions afterwards. So one of the best ways to learn aside from getting out there and doing it, aside from film breakdown, is watching live action of whatever sport you're involved in. Um, as part of that, if you're in a sport where there are pre-games and post-games, see if you can attend the pre-game and post-game with your mentor. And that is, of course, if it's okay with the crew. So most, I would say 99% of the crews in the state of New Mexico are going to be okay with a new official being in their pre-game or post-game. You, you know, you don't want to take over their pre or post-game, but be in there and take notes about how a pregame and a postgame actually work. So that's a great way to learn. That's a great way to generate questions that you can later ask your mentor or if the time is appropriate to ask, you know, in that moment. And then make sure you communicate your needs to your mentors. So what is it that you're needing help with? Um, is it the administrative side of things? Is it the, you know, how do I get online and register? And where do I find information about the state clinic? Or is it the actual on court, on field, on the mat, in the pool um, situation? Those are all, you know, th those are things you need to let the mentor know. It's just, we talk a lot about an evaluation and observation. If people don't know how they're doing, they can't get better. If a mentor doesn't know what it is that you're needing, he or she can't help you. So just make sure you're, you're having an active line of communication with that mentor at all times. Anything on those? Um, how to be a good uh, mentee. Um, this is, Dana talked about it. It's a relationship. Um, I know that there are a few mentors that I have that seem like they're always busy. Okay. They're always, they've got their regular job. They've got their officiating, their working games. And every time I text them, they just, you know, they may give me a short line or, hey, let me get back to you. And then they don't respond. But it's your job as a mentee to reach out to the mentor. Um, you know, the, the, the mentor or the mentor, you know, they are busy, but they're not too busy to help. you. And unless you are bugging them, you know, it's, um, you know, it's really, um, what am I trying to say? It's, it's there. It pretty much, it's your responsibility as the mentee to reach out to your mentor um, because trust me, they're willing to help you. Yes, they're busy, but ultimately they want, you know, they want to help you. So they will get back to you. It's your job to bug them. And there's a few messages that have come in the chat. So I'll read through those before we go to the next section. Um, Leonard, a great mentoring program will help with the recruitment and retention of officials. Those younger officials may talk to their peers and let them know how much they've been helped to get better and they should come and be an official. Other officials are always willing to help new officials. Very true. Uh, Wayne Galdoni, a mentor can make a huge difference in their attitude and the level of their voice. That's also true. Wilson, uh, Ed Rush note, which I love. If you cannot add something of value, don't say anything. Man, now that doesn't just apply to officiating. That's just the, the world. Like. If, everybody, yeah, if everybody would not add something that is unnecessary, we'd be in a better spot. 
Um, Julian, uh, don't be afraid to ask questions. Take what you like. Don't use what doesn't work specifically for you. Mechanics and philosophy are all borrowed. Always remember, and this is a Wilson Hollandism, always remember two ears and one mouth, use them in that proportion. That's another thing I'm putting on my headstone. Uh, Brad, be present and don't t tell too many war stories without listening to what your mentee needs. Absolutely. Because we all love the war stories, but there's times where you need to just get down to the brass tacks and address what the, the mentor needs addressed. And then Steve, this is a great point. Communicate what your best form of communication is. Is it phone? Is it email? Is it text? Do you Snapchat? Absolutely. Are you on Instagram? Is it Facebook? Are you really old school on MySpace? I mean, there's a million ways to communicate. Make sure smoke signals, that would also work. So make sure that you and your mentee, you and your mentor know what the best form of communication is. You know, we have an assigner here in New Mexico that does not text message. Um, if you all know me, which most of you do, I communicate 95% on text message just because it's the easiest way to you know, multitask really, I'll be on a phone call while text messaging and answering emails, which might be why some of my stuff is confusing at times. But make sure you all know how to get a hold of each other best. Um, mentor works for the mentee. So make sure as a mentor, you're asking the question of how can I help you? And uh, there is no such thing as a stupid question. The only stupid question is the one that is not asked. Absolutely. Again, that's a life lesson, not just officiating. And then uh, show your mentee where the question is in the rule book. That's, that's very good. Get, you know, get familiar with all of that stuff as a mentor so that you're prepared to help your mentee. So the yeah. relationship, did someone Sorry, have Sorry, hold on, Dana, real quick. I want to touch on Wayne's. Uh, what I really like about that is, trust me, for the first four or five years, uh, new officials aren't rule books. You know, they're not rule book people. Um, uh, I don't consider myself a rule book person now. Um, in fact, I will call a mentor and ask them what a rule is before I actually look it up. That's okay. But eventually they will turn into those rule book people. And, and so um, what I love about that is where the question is the rule book, because chances are as a mentor, you know where it's at, help them find it, give them the reference, they'll look it up eventually. But don't expect, don't expect your mentee to be a rule book person um, right off the bat because it, it'll take years for that to happen. So thanks, Wayne. I actually enjoyed that one. And uh, let's see, rule book study togethers. Absolutely. Get, you know, get together in those little groups and just go over rules, go over plays, talk officiating, because the more you talk officiating, the more it's going to become second nature to you. It's going to be a part of, of what you do. I mean, there have been times where I'll have to go out of town for a, a clinic and I'll meet up with a group of officials to, you know, to have dinner while I'm there and all they want to do is talk about officiating. And I'm like, can we talk about something else? But they're, you know, those groups of officials, when they get together, that's what, that's what they want to talk about. And those are the groups as a, as a newer official that you need to try to associate yourself with because they're the ones who are, you know, dedicating that time to their craft. So the relationship, how do we make a successful partnership, marriage, relationship, whatever you want to call it, mentors, be there for and with your mentee and help them succeed with you. Make sure you have your mentee's success at the center of what you're telling him or her. Mentees, listen to your mentor, ask good questions, and don't be afraid to put yourself out there. You know, officiating, obviously, when you're out on the, the playing surface, whatever it is, um, it takes a lot of courage. And that courage really starts with your willingness to find a mentor, ask questions, be active in your local group, because, it, you know, sometimes it's a little scary to, to ask a question because you think that it might be you know, everybody knows that. No, there might be three other people in the room that don't know that. Be an active newer official. And, and as veterans, don't put people down if they ask questions that you, you know, you're going to sit there and roll your eyes. We don't, we don't want that either. We've got to encourage growth and, and education of our newer officials. And then again, open and honest communication is critical to a successful mentor-mentee relationship. Um, mentees can't 
feel like they're going to get their their heads bit off by their mentor when they call them for something and you know knowing how to communicate with the other person and where like we talked about that's super important for that for that relationship um so using the verbiage of let's go do it instead of you go do it um you know it's so much more encouraging when when you approach a mentorship as though you're in it together instead of I well you know you go take care of it no let's do that or how can I help you do that so that way you're working toward the same goal um, just like any relationship it takes two active participants for a mentorship to work and then if it isn't working from either side break it off um, you know we all every single person who is an official in the state of New Mexico except for those who have retired from their initial careers we all have lives and jobs and families and other commitments if you as a mentor have a mentee who's just far too demanding, you know, we need to reassign that person to somebody who might have a little bit more time. So that way they're still getting the attention they need and then we'll address that issue as well. But you know, if it isn't working for either of you, just move on and let, let's find a better fit for both of you. So um, if, if anyone watched the last dance, you know, the whole Chicago Bulls, Michael Jordan in one of the episodes, and I believe it was episode five, um, he taught at the very end, they cut it off and he, he said, you know, he starts to he starts to cry because he's so passionate about it. And they're pretty much talking about how his teammates really kind of didn't like him, you know, but, you know, the whole point was, is, and he said, you know, I never asked them to do anything that I wasn't willing to do myself. And, and that kind of, you know, when we talk about mentoring, that's absolutely what it is. You know, you, you have to be willing to do everything that you're telling your mentor to do, so. Okay, so that is, um, that is the brunt of the presentation. We've gone a little under an hour, but we do wanna open it up for questions. Um, First of all, thank you all for joining. We have 79-ish participants on with us tonight. That's a great number and we appreciate your willingness to either be a mentor or be mentored. Um, we'll send the slides of this out so that if you wanna go back and look at anything, it'll be available for you. And as, as I mentioned earlier, I was taking pictures of who is on this so that we can make sure we put you in our, in our spreadsheet for people who want to be a part of the mentorship process and system within the state of New Mexico. Uh, one of the things that we're looking to build as we move forward is kind of a, an officiating 101 curriculum that is for first through third year officials, um, kind of an introductory manual and that kind of stuff. So the mentorship portion will certainly be important as we develop that. Um, We'll open it up for questions. You can either type it in the chat room or you can unmute yourself and just ask via your voice. So, Nate, unless you have anything else, we'll open it up. No, let's open it up for some questions. All right. Fire away, attendees. Oh, it's a quiet group. They are. Will this be broken down by sports or will it stay as a group? Um, Sam, it will probably get broken into like a team sport versus individual sport. It's going to be very similar for a lot of the team sports. For swimming and diving, track and field and wrestling, there might be some variance. Um, track and field especially, that's completely, uh, that's completely different um, for a number of reasons. It's a very informal structure right now. So as we, as we formalize the structure of track and field officiating, we'll also implement a lot of the mentoring aspect. Um, but it won't be a sport by sport. It'll be, it'll be pretty general because most of, the, most of the concepts are very, very similar. So, and Wilson Holland said, if, if anyone needs his help to give you their, to give you his information. So shoot me an email if anybody wants that. You know, and I know Wilson talks about film breakdown on the basketball side, but Wilson is, is a great person to talk about officiating and, and just the process. Um, if you're not a basketball official and you have questions about that process, talk to Wilson Holland. He'll, he'll give you some advice. Absolutely. 
Hey, Dana and Nate, this is Steve Franco. I've got a question, general question for the audience. Uh-huh. Um, I have a particular challenge in my sport, and um, this is kind of a, a challenge of being a mentor, I guess. You have a mentee that drastically, dramatically wants to get better. The individual is, uh, they go out and they do everything that a mentee should be doing. However, they don't quite have that it factor. So no matter what they do or how they do it, they're just not going to progress the way we, we think uh, officials should progress in their career, okay? Um, on the other end of the spectrum, uh, you have, <clears throat> excuse me, you have somebody that uh, does have, truly have the it factor, and they are really the diamond in the rough. And this is somebody that you could really take far and uh, move ahead. However, they don't have that desire to move forward. Uh, they don't have the desire to, I don't want to say step up in the limelight, but take that next step to, you know, towards officiating. How would somebody else handle that particular situation with those two particular mentees? So I, um, Steve, I will actually touch on the diamond in the rough um, first. And the diamond in the rough, it seems to me that those diamonds in the rough tend to um, think that they don't need any help and they don't, um, you know, need a mentor or, and, and chances are, it, honestly, the chances are that that mentor probably needs to come from a different avenue. They need, I mean, they almost need a higher level mentor and that's okay. And, and I, I brought that up earlier saying that, you know, it's just like an education. Uh, sometimes students need to be challenged. And if the teacher isn't challenging them, they aren't interested. Yes, they're, they're extremely talented and they, they are very knowledgeable and they, they pick up really fast, but chances are, you know, they're bored. And, and so at that point as the mentor, it, it might be your time to cut that relationship and tell them, hey, you know what? Let me introduce you to so-and-so. I think that they can really help you. You know, that is a part of that mentorship that, you know, if you can, it's one, getting rid of the ego and saying, eh, you know what, uh, this young and thinks that they know more than I do. Well, it's not that they know more than you, but they're pretty talented and they need a challenge. So let's find somebody that's, that you know needs that or that can meet that requirement. And, and that would be that. Um, as far as the one that's not going to be there, um, you know, those are the hard conversations. The, you know, having those conversations and letting them know, you know, look, understand, um, you know, we got to keep working, but you got to keep working on little things. Don't expect, you know, a, a varsity schedule this year. Don't expect a varsity schedule next year. You know, we need to work on these things until you can get there. Set, set those goals and, and make those um, um, goals realistic so that when they do reach the, the little goals, there is some kind of success, okay? Not every official is meant to, to reach the next level. Not every official is meant to work a state championship, but they can still enjoy it. They can still have fun. Um, and part of that is setting the small goals so that they can reach at least those small goals. And Oscar, your, your point is absolutely 100% correct. It could be that they're just there to get the extra money. And if, they're, you know, if there's somebody who's in this because they want the extra income, which is fine, they probably aren't going to actively seek out a mentor anyway. Um, they're, they're there to collect a check, and we know that we have officials that are doing it simply to supplement their income. But those are the people that as mentors, you, you learn pretty quickly that those aren't the people that you want to invest your, your time in. Um, you know, we can't, we can't force people to go the path that we want them to. Um, you know, with regard to the kind of diamond in the rough, 
a lot of times it just takes a little bit of promoting those individuals. Um, Nate and I, for years, we'll either see an official at a game or at a camp that has just a ton of potential. And, you know, we'll talk to their assigners about, you know, I don't know if you've looked at this person, but you might want to go look at him because whatever it is, he or she has it. So sometimes it just takes somebody advocating with an assigner, with our office, with a, you know, an official observer, that kind of thing, to get them to where they start to, to get that positive feedback and, you know, improve game schedule and whatever the case may be. So sometimes you've just got to serve in that advocacy role and, and get eyes on that individual. So I think that officials who are doing it just for the money, we probably aren't going to invest a lot of time in mentoring them because they don't want it. But then the ones that are diamonds in the rough who maybe don't want to advocate for themselves, we need to be their advocates. So Steve, I don't know if that helps at all. But I don't know if anybody else on the on the webinar has any info. Hey, Dana, this is John Medina. Hey, John, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. I think another definition for mentorship is leadership. So when you describe yourself as a leader, you use those same terms you had on some of the slides of instead of you do it, it's let's do it, or I'm going to do it alongside you. So for Steve's question, being a leader slash mentor means you have these frank conversations with the individual. That's a successful mentor-mentee relationship. And you can take them aside and say, what are your goals? And what do you hope to achieve this year, or maybe within five years? And you give them realistic feedback and say, if that's your goal, this is the path you need to follow. The current path that you're on is never going to get you. Maybe your attitude needs to change. Maybe you need to spend more time reading the rule book or spend more time in front of the mirror. And those frank conversations, I believe, will get you to the point where you say, I see you succeeding or you may have to look elsewhere because I'm not the person that can help you achieve those goals with this current relationship. That, that's awesome advice, John. Thank you. Yeah, Dana. And yes. uh, um, again, going back to both of them, I'm, I'm glad John Medina came on just before because uh, uh, I helped mentor John. And John is a great example of uh, someone who has gone beyond what I could help him with. I mean, John is the official of the year this year. Congratulations, John. Um, uh, he is a, a great success story, uh, just like Jim Farmer many years ago. Um, I mean, John's gone way be beyond what, what I can help him with anymore. Uh, but uh, uh, a couple of things, you know, as a, as a mentor, uh, you've only got X amount of time. And, and you know this, Steve. And uh, it's almost to the point where you know, you're approached by so many people and, and you, that it factor is what you're looking for. And uh, uh, you, you have, uh, Dana, you refer to it as the uh, yeah, but. You know, you can only spend so much time with that before you realize you're just not going to get anywhere with this person. You know, you're, you're looking for that diamond in the rough that has the John Medina factor that wants to get somewhere and is willing to take advice and wants to progress and stuff. And, and then you also have a person that can... Uh, that knows the rule book forwards and backwards, uh, but doesn't have uh, or is unwilling to uh, accept advice or apply common sense, which is something we haven't spoken about, because not everything is in the rule book. You know, personality is not in the rule book, and that's a huge part of officiating in, in, in at least the way I see it. Um, 
So uh, unfortunately, you know, we cannot, uh, at least as individuals, and Steve, you know this as well, we cannot take on everyone that approaches us to be a mentor. And uh, we have to find those people like uh, uh, John Medina is out there that uh, are willing to take advice and do the things that are necessary to come forward and have common sense, um, which is something you can't teach. You know, it's unfortunate, but uh, that's, that's the way it is. You know, those are just my comments. Thanks, John. So we've got a number of items popping up in the chat room. Uh, Jerry CV, you said you had a question. I just unmuted you if you'd like to ask your question. Uh, for me, being a first year official, um, I have a lot of, um, for me, I'm in battlefields to ball fields. And it's frustrating because I do football and basketball. And it's like, I get told a lot that I'm straight up only in eighth grade level for basketball, but I want to get better. But then you try to get better and you got people telling you you're not ready yet. And then it's frustrating. And then you're like, like, cause I want battlefield to ball field to get their money's worth. And I'm in all the game films. I'm in all the meetings, but then it seems like sometimes it's favoritism. Cause you have people that aren't at meetings that get like the four, a five, a games and they bury you down on the res or somewhere else. So sometimes it gets frustrating, but then I tell myself that I have to prove it. And that's where being a first year official, you got to stay into that mindset. But sometimes it feels like they have their set people that have been doing it for 20 years and you're going to get buried down in like JV or C team for like four or five years. And it's like, if you have that mentor or that person that wants to go far, why not just help them get up there instead of just throwing them down in the minors? That's just me being my first year last year with some things I kind of learned doing games. I know I struggled, but I always ask for game film. I always ask people to help me, but they were like, you're not ready. So then it's like, where do you go from there? Like, and yeah. Jerry, I think, uh, you know, one of the things that we are, Nate and I talk about quite a bit is, you know, 10 years ago, varsity yeah. games were not assigned to officials until their fourth or fifth year. People have been advanced a little bit more quickly in the last number of years just because of the shortage of officials. Um, it would be the preference of our association to probably not have first and second year officials calling varsity from the standpoint of giving them some game experience. Because a lot of what happens is when we advance officials too quickly, there's, an, there's a situation that they can't handle just because they don't have the game experience and then they end up quitting. So we really, you know, a lot of times we're trying to protect newer officials so that they're prepared to work at that next level. Um, you know, with regard to your individual situation, please feel free to give Nate or I a call and we can talk to you a little bit more rather than, rather than being in a, a totally public forum. But Nate and I are happy to have that conversation with you offline um, at the office. So just let us know and we can set up a time to have a conversation with you. Okay, so yeah, I, that's fine. And, and, I, and I've talked about this um, with multiple people, and I, I've made mention that um, they're pretty, right now we have about three generations of officials, right, in all sports. And there was, there's our most veteran official who, when they first started, they, it took them 10 years to work varsity games and matches, you know. Then, you know, it took them 10 – 15 years to work any kind of postseason. Then there was that middle tier who kind of, they were mentored by this veteran group. So their idea of moving to that next level was it's going to take me 10 years to get a varsity game. Okay. And then we ran into this, this shortage of officials where we didn't have enough officials and this third generation kind of came in and, all of a sudden they're getting varsity games in their first year, the second year. Okay. And now this middle generation is like, well, wait a minute. I had to wait six or seven years to get a, my first varsity game. And this young, this young end over here is getting the varsity game in their first year. You know, so um, we, Dana and I, like she said, we talk about it all the time. I, I think that, you know, the idea would be to, 
you know, kind of slow roll our, our newer officials in, let them get some C and JVs and middle school experience. But of course we are in a situation where assigners have to use some of these first year officials um, to, to cover games. Um, again, ideally, you know, if they're telling you that you are to work a certain level, take that and, and ask, ask the question, what do I need to do then to get to that next level? And, and as soon as you can prove that and they, you earn their trust, right? Because trust is a big part of this, okay? Especially with your assigner. Assigners, you know, want to put individuals on, on games that they trust. So as a, a, as a newer official, learn what your assigner um, um, likes and something that they can trust. And, and trust me, you will start to elevate your game at a faster rate. So Nate, I've got a number of comments here that are very good. I'm gonna read them. The reason I'm reading all these out loud, I know you all can see them. The uh, typed in comments don't show up on the recording. So I just wanna make sure that they're included. Uh, Wayne Galdoni, um, don't treat like the men, don't treat the mentee like they don't know anything. So if, if a mentee makes a mistake during a game, talk softly after the game and explain the situation um, rather than just, you know, demeaning them or belittling them. Rick Carbajal, there are officials who truly have no desire to get to the next level and are very satisf satisfied where they are. I would encourage them to excel at that level and not push them past that point until such a time as they're ready. And that's absolutely right. We have a lot of officials over the years who have told me, you know what, Dana, I just want to call sub varsity. I know I've done this for 30 years, but this is what I enjoy and the kids are fun and I don't have, you know, I don't want to call varsity. So be aware of, especially as assigners and, and mentors and evaluators, be aware of where they want to be because if they don't want to call varsity, then that's okay too. We need officials at all levels. Uh, Robert Nunez, for the mentees, listen, stay positive, and take what works for you. Mentor, understand who you are working with, honesty, and steer toward their abilities and intent in the avocation. Great advice. Um, Big John Vic, never make the mentee feel like they failed. Instead, make them feel like they can improve. Absolutely. Um, Jason, be a sponge. Take in as much information as you can and be able to apply the things that are asked of you. Yeah, Because you will get information overload at some point, so you need to kind of dissect what you're given and, and work on a couple of things at a time, not all 12 things at once, because that's probably not going to be good for anything. Um, oh, and Robert Nunez did tell Jerry CB, thank you for your service, and I do echo that to anybody who served. Uh, Steve Wagner. One of the most important things we can teach a new official is how to approach officials at all levels with questions in a way as to not come off as challenging that official's experience. That's great advice, Steve. Um, you know, the, there is the right way to ask a question and, and the wrong way. So I think as both mentors and mentees, that's that communication piece. Uh, Rebecca, great piece of advice for mentees in choosing a mentor is to be strategic in your selection of your mentor or mentors. That is absolutely true. Um, you know, it's not something that you have to do on your first meeting night. You can take a little time and see who you, you know, who you click with a little bit. And also those who are prospective mentors, you know, see who you want to seek out as a mentee. It, you know, it's a, it's a two way street for sure when it comes to that mentor mentee relationship. Um, any other questions? It looks like we've cleared out the, the chat area. Dana, this is Sam. Hey, Sam. Gomez. Uh, I want to touch back on Steve's uh, deal about the officials, the two different types, the one that does not have the it factor and the oh. one that uh, is a diamond in the rough uh -huh. but won't take the mentorship. Uh, for those ones that don't have the it factor, people can be trained. You just have to have a lot of patience with them. Uh, and it may take a, more than a year to get them there. But if they've got the heart and they've got the desire and they're willing to learn, I think those ones in the long run will make your best officials. You just have to have the patience with them. Thanks, Sam. Well, so Sam and, and, and everybody else, this is kind of like my situation. Um, 
the individual that does not have the it factor has been at the sport for seven to eight years and is still working lower level competition. The, uh, the other individual, the diamond in the rough, so to speak, um, has been involved in the sport for almost 40 years. And it's not that they, <clears throat> excuse me, it's not that they don't want to learn. It's not that they're there from the money for the money. Um, I think it's more, more of the politics that they see that's going on within, not necessarily our sport, but all the other sports. Okay, so they are truly, they are truly as passionate about the sport. It's just the officiating portion, uh, dealing with parents, dealing with coaches. You know, maybe they shouldn't officiate. You know, that may be it. But regarding the, uh, um, regarding the uh, thinking that they're better than they really are or better than the mentee or should I pass them on to somebody else, um, unfortunately, this individual, there's only a few mentors that, uh, that they would trust, that they would live with, you know, and they just don't want to do their mentee or their mentor, sorry, they just don't want to do their mentor uh, any bad will by, uh, by in, trying to imply that, yes, they are better than uh, somebody else because they truly can be. Uh, they are meant, the individual is a mentor um, all by themselves because they, uh, they have other people that gravitate to them because people can see this individual has the skills. You know, it's just trying to get this, it's trying to get the one official to have the, have the willingness to step up, but the individual just doesn't want to take the step. So that's, yeah. that's, that's where that's at. Steve, those individuals and, and see, those individuals are hard because um, at some point uh, they became disgruntled or they're unhappy with um, the situation with within the officiating community. And at that point, um, you know, I don't know if there's much that you can do other than, you know, um, to motivate that individual. Um, all you can do is, is, you know, hope that they continue to, to serve the student athletes um, for the right reasons. Um, but again, you know, trust me, every official on this call and future officials is, is not always going to be happy with their assigner or their assignments or, or any situation. And that's myself included. But, you know, I, I do have a positive outlook for officiating and my willingness to, to want to try to get better regardless of what my schedule looks like or anything like that, um, you know, that, that's gotta be the motivating factor. Um, and so, you know, that's the conversation that you need to have with your mentee or that mentee that's struggling with that scenario. Is asked the question, you know, are you doing this for the student athletes and, and the love of the sport or are you doing this for, you know, yourself. And that, and then that's kind of what you have to ask that mentee. Hey, hey, Nate, I have something here. Um, he was talking about one of the officials feeling like things are politicized. Um, and one of the things I did back in Wisconsin, as a matter of fact, um, there was issues in Wisconsin with the signing and people felt it was politicized and all that stuff. And some of the officials came to me and said, Hey, you know, we need to make a change. And we feel that you can be a part of that change. And I decided to dip my both feet into a signing and try to have a level field as far as the signing goes and, and all that stuff. And it worked. Uh, I developed a mentorship back in Wisconsin in the area, in the district I was in, and <laughs> mentored quite a, a couple few guys. And one of the guys went on to work in ML, MILB, just got the call last year. So, um, but as far as politicizing goes, I guess my thing would be talk to the person if they feel it's politicized, get on the board, make a change. They can be make a difference. And, you know, you said they're naturally drawn to be a mentor. That's somebody that, that might be able to get voted on the board and then make a change and, and, and change that politicizing if they feel that way and, and you know, get and hopefully make a change that way. That's just my input. And I think, you know, when you talk a little bit about the assignment process, one of the things that we're always trying to 
get across to officials is officials overall are competitive because most of them are former athletes and, and competition is fine. But what happens all too often in this industry is we worry so much about what everybody else has. Oh, why does, you know, why does Nate get more games than I do? And I've done this longer than him. And, you know, there, there becomes a little bit of that. Instead of worrying about the games that you're assigned, you're worried about why everybody else's schedule, in your opinion, is better than yours. And in your mind, you feel like you're a better official than that person without ever having a real conversation with you know, with anybody about that. So I think the more as mentors, um, we can let our mentees know that they need to focus on their games and not everybody else's. And as mentors, you need to practice that as well. Um, that That is a helpful thing because it's just, I think in that spirit of competition, sometimes it just gets a little bit misguided. And those are a lot of the calls that Nate and I get. And we'll have officials who will name names of, well, I think I'm better than Joe, Tom, Bill, Debbie, and Harry, and I'm like, based upon what? And they'll go evaluation. I'm like, who's evaluation? Well, mine. Well, what makes you an evaluator? You know, it, it just, it's stuff like that that I, I try to wrap my head around and have yet to figure it out. But I think that we just need to focus and be positive with whichever games we're assigned and at whatever level. And, and, and something else too is like, this is my first year ever have i ever become a three sport official um and my and and two sports i'm very weak at but the strongest sport at baseball i feel i have a lot to offer to younger officials and help with recruiting and stuff like that and and that's something that you know like i'm gonna probably be a mentee and i hope to be a mentor in the strongest you know strongest sport that i am in so and that's that's something i think we all need to look within too is multi-sport officials is what is our strongest sport and what is our weakest sport? One, one sport we can get stronger in one sport. We can, one sport we can help to make people stronger again. And, and that's, you know, that's awesome for you to say of, you know, and I can be a mentor in one sport and a mentee in, in another sport because sometimes we, we don't see that ability. So I think that that's awesome. And I think that sometimes being, a mentee actually kind of helps you be a better mentor. So I think, you know, you can kind of learn what to do or what not to do through that experience. So, and trust me, and trust me, sir, you will, you will be helping us mentor. And now that I know about your other skill set, I'm, <laughs> we've, I'm taking notes. So that's good. Thank you for letting us know that. Well, and, and big John, even in the two sports that you feel like you're not uh, as proficient and I mean you have that ability you have that leadership quality that will help you mentor in those two other sports as well so just because and we talked about it at the beginning just because you may know the mechanics and the rules in one sport better than the other two sports doesn't mean that you can't mentor in those other two sports absolutely you know you're at the end of the day we're all officials and if you've officiated one sport you know, you know exactly what it takes to lead and mentor individuals in other sports. Okay. Um, any other questions before we wrap up? And this is, you know, the intent of this tonight was just kind of an introductory to get people starting to think about mentorship and, and kind of be a springboard into this this coming season and, you know, looking at developing some formalized structure as well as some, um, some informal stuff. So certainly once this ends, it's not the end of talking about mentorship. We'll send out this slideshow. And if you have questions or suggestions, we're, our, our ears are open. And I think you all know that about our association. We are membership led, which means that we rely very heavily upon our officials to help us with this, this kind of stuff. You know, unfortunately there's only, two of us in our office that work directly with officials and we, department. you know, yes, the department, we call ourselves the department because it makes us feel like we have a staff of many. Um, so, you know, please share your ideas with us and let us know how we can help. We know that New Mexico is very geographically challenged and we've got a lot of idiosyncrasies from group to group and sport to sport that we need to, to address. And while, you know, while we can have ideas and, and, PowerPoints that are pretty general, there might be some some special situations that we need to address as well. So 
our ears are open. We're here for you and, and please help us by being a part of this process. Tonight was the first step and we appreciate your attention and your participation. And uh, we hope that this will start a good conversation among our membership. So thank you for your time. Uh, Nate, do you have any closing thoughts? No, I just want to thank everyone that participated uh, tonight. I think it was a, a, it's a good starting point in a conversation that needs to take place regularly. And so uh, we'll continue to do this, I would imagine. And let's, let's keep getting better. And, and I know that uh, our office motto is we will play again in New Mexico. So, um, you know, I know that there are a lot of questions. I think everybody calls our office or sends us an email asking us a question about, you know, a rating or registration or something followed by, hey, so what are your thoughts on, um, you know, the upcoming season? Are we going to play? Um, look, as, as we find out, I know Dana will tell you, as we find out, we will release information. So, um, you know, we, we are all kind of just Dana and I are moving along like we're going to have sports next season and and that's the plan um we're we'll, keeping our fingers crossed and we'll, we'll do so and we'll keep trucking along as long you know until we're told otherwise but you know as of right now we'll do what we have to do to get ready and that's you know as an official prepare you know rule study um physical fitness and everything else that comes with preparing for your season so um, thank you for being here. Absolutely. Thanks again, everybody, for your time. And I hope you have a wonderful night. And uh, certainly, if you think of anything once we end, feel free to shoot us a, a text or an email. Um, those of you who are thanking us in the chat, you're welcome. John Hartog, your comment just made me laugh. Um, but we, we really do appreciate everybody and your dedication to the association. Um, please know we're here for you. And uh, we're here to serve. So call us if you need us and uh, we will, you'll be hearing a lot more from us as the, uh, as the season gets a little bit closer. So have a great night, stay safe, stay healthy, stay sanitized, and we'll talk to you soon. Dana and Nate, thank you. Thank you. I hey, appreciate you. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Dana and Nate, thanks guys. Of Good course. Night. Good night. Good night, everybody. Thanks, Paul Gorris. Richard Sanchez.